All right. Oh wait. Oh wait. Oh wait. Oh wait. All right. Welcome, welcome then, welcome, O oh poets, then, to our enclave, to uh, the world which we will invite before us, an aesthetic world which we will, oh, lay out with what we bring, the furnish, furnishments or the instruments. The instruments are perception. The furnishings are the works of art. So we will explore this evening. We will explore um, in dialogue, in a kind of a dialogue. We will explore in dialogue with the world created by the artworks of Robinson Jeffers, by the artworks and the life course and the mystique of that life and the times, the background against with against which or amidst which the life can be contemplated. The world created by the poetic works of Robinson Jeffers. But, you know, poets, right? Isn't it um, sometimes fruitful to um, step into that world um, through the work of another poet, maybe looking, looking around at that other poet and um, seeing some kind of similarity or, or, or resemblance or... or synchronicity or correspondence. So here's a poem by someone who's learned much from Robinson Jeffers. This is a poem by a California poet as well named Gary Snyder. Some of you may be familiar with him. And for some reason I feel drawn uh, to what he has to say is an entry point for, for us as we go into the world of Robinson Jeffers later on. But this, this poem by Gary Snyder is called Word Basket Woman. Years after surviving the Warsaw Uprising, she wrote the poems of ordinary people building barricades while being shot at. Small poems were all that could hold so much close to life. Small poems were all that could hold so much close to death, life, without making it false. Small poems were all that could hold so much close to death, life, without making it false. Robinson Jeffers, his tall, cold view, quite true in a way, but why did he say it? as though he alone stood above our delusions. He also feared death, insignificance, and was not quite up to the inhuman beauty of parsnips and diapers, the deathless nobility at the core of all ordinary things. I dwell in a house on the long west slope of Sierra Nevada, 200 mile swell of granite, Bones of the ancient Buddha miles back from the sea coast, on a line of fiery chakras in the deep nerve web of the land. Europe forgotten now, almost a dream, but our writing is sideways and Roman, and the language, a compote of old wars and tribes from some place overseas, here at the rim of the world where the panaka calls in the cha. The heart words are pomo, naiwak, nisanan, and the small poem word baskets stretched to the heft of their burden. I came this far to tell of the grave of my great-grandmother, Harriet Callicott, by itself, on a low ridge in Kansas. The sandstone tumbled, her name almost eaten away, where I found it in rain-drenched grass, on my knees, closed my eyes, and swooped under the earth to that dark loam, holding her emptiness, and placed one cool kiss on the arch of her white pubic bone. So, 
The poem is a world in and of itself, more than one world, I would say, <laughs> five or six worlds. And uh, as all poems, as all lines of all poems, deserves an exploration into itself that would last all eternity. But still, I was drawn to read this because of his mention of Robinson Jeffers. And I want to say something about that, which is kind of funny. But before I do, the first part about the years after surviving the Warsaw Uprising, she wrote the poems of ordinary people building barricades while being shot at. Small poems were all that could hold so much close to death life without making it false. I don't know who he's talking about. I believe it, it could be someone like Anna Akhmatova, who spent time in the Stalinist labor camps, who, it is said once, in a lineup among people who had long been imprisoned and were long used to speaking to each other as if the others were anonymous beings, and to speak in whispers and to merely be endeavoring to survive. Prisoners they were. But Anna Akhmatova relates that someone recognized her from the time when neither one of them were prisoners and were in the outside free world and recognized her as the poet Anna Akhmatova and called to her by name. And Anna Akhmatova turned around, you know, and acknowledged, yes, that she was that person. And then another one nearby, hungry-eyed and gaunt-faced, hollow, hollow-lipped, said to her, Oh, poet, can you describe this? And she said, Yes, I have words to describe this. And the hollow pallor of this woman long prisoner seemed to flow with a smile, seemed to blossom for just a moment behind the ashy visage, visage and in, in a flowering of, 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 of grace and the awareness of grace that such a place could be described in words. But that's another story in another world in and of itself. But in the poem, Gary Snyder goes on to say, Robinson Jeffers' his tall, cold view, quite true in a way. But why did he say it as though he alone stood above our delusions? He also feared death insignificance and was not quite up to the inhuman beauty of parsnips or diapers, the deathless nobility at the core of all ordinary things, which is pretty funny, actually, because this, you know, calls upon sometimes, sometimes the mystique or the reputation that Robinson Jeffers has is that of an arhat, you know, one who stands at the edge of the world in their one's own dwelling built by the stones that one has placed together by one's own self, and in that place can cast a cold eye upon our times and upon the world and upon the natural world and upon all the worlds of the stars and the planets and the pitiful human passions and conflicts. And so sometimes people see Robinson Jeffers and, and sees him as an exemplar of that and, and even go so far as to ask irreverently, perhaps and playfully, what does he know about parsnips and diapers? Well, we can find out. We can find out. In one of those uh, craggy, Lucretian, negatively transcendental poems, and find out what he knows, believe it or not, about diapers in a creation poem, so to speak. In a creation poem that Robinson Jeffers wrote later in life, and it wasn't titled even, so it wasn't a contribution in it didn't become part of any like great public perception of him because that had already happened. He had already, with his strong ego, or strong persona, perhaps I should say, that fit right into the profile of what the age demanded of a poet at that time, enough to have a face that ended up on the cover of Time magazine in 1932 or sometime like that. And, you know, in, in, in enjoyed and or endured a certain kind of success in the social and the public world, winning many awards, and even, you know, appearing on Broadway in staged plays, you know, was the work of Dame Judith Anderson in bringing um, Jefferson's verse dramas to the stage and the tremendous performance art that resulted from that collaboration 
you know, is, is also part of our cultural heritage. Dame Judith Anderson and Robinson Jeffers and <clears throat> his plays based on Medea and, and based on the works of Euripides and the Greek tragedarians. But here's the poem where I think if we go into this, we can begin to see a little bit of the world of, of Robinson Jeffers that we make in dialogue with that world through contemplation of the artworks, which I present to you. This one, it's a creation myth. He speaks of the earth like a mare, a mare, and the stallion of the sun. The earth, she was like a mare, eyeing the stallion, screaming for life in the womb. Her atmosphere was the breath of her passion, not the blithe air men breathe and live, but marsh gas, ammonia, sulfured hydrogen. Such poison as our remembering bodies return to when they die and decay, and the end of life meets its beginning. The sun heard her and stirred her thick air with fierce lightnings and flagellations of germinal power, building impossible molecules, amino acids, and flashy unstable proteins. Thence life was born, its nitrogen from ammonia, carbon from methane, water from the cloud, and salts from the young seas it dribbled down into the primal ocean like a babe's urine, soaking the cloth. So when Gary Snyder asked, what did he know of diapers? <laughs> you know, well, here, this, you know, in a Lucretian creation myth, he speaks of the chemical composition of the unformed earth, and he compares it to something known intimately in the cycle of life, you know, from from us human beings, us nurturing mammals. <laughs> Water from the cloud and salt from the young seas, it dribbled down into the primal ocean like a babe's urine, soaking the cloth. Heavily built protein molecules, chemically growing, bursting apart as the tensions and the inordinate, inordinate molecule become unbearable. That is to say, growing and reproducing themselves, a virus on the warm ocean. Okay. This is the language of the myth of science, is it not? Of the creation of the earth. But is it not true also in the ancient Greek, Greek myths of the birth of Aphrodite? Was she not born from an errant particle from the body of Kronos, dismembered and cast into the sea? floating in the ocean, or was it simply froth from the wave? All we know is that the waves rolled and there appeared Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beautiful stepping onto shore, flowers blooming in her footsteps, but born from the froth, from the flaky nothingness of the ocean, the mother of all life. Time and the world changed, back to the poem, Time in the world changed. The proteins were no longer created. The ammoniac atmosphere and the great storms, no more. This virus now must labor to maintain itself. It clung together into bundles of life, which we call cells, with microscopic walls enclosing themselves against the world. But why would life maintain itself, being nothing but a dirty scum on the sea, dropped from foul air? Could it perhaps perceive glories to come? <laughs> Could it foresee that cellular life would make the mountain forest and the eagle dawning monstrously beautiful, wings, eyes, and claws dawning over the rock ridge? and a passionate human intelligence straining its limits, striving to understand itself and the universe to the last galaxy. Flamantia Moenia Munde, Lucretius wrote, alliterating like a Saxon, 
All those M's mean majesty. The flaming world walls, far-flung fortifications of being against non-being. A formation in strife, right? This is the gloss part, you know? We are here in the realms of Heraclitus with his gnomic phrases. And yet, when we come to the poetic world of Robinson Jeffers, what we begin to see is built on the models of the ancient classical poets such as Lucretius. And I know of no other one exactly like Lucretius. And of course, you know, Euripides, as I've mentioned, the tragedarian, and all the other tragedarians. And the sun-washed rural world of Homer. And, of course, the English extravagances and Elizabethan attention to details conveyed by the world, the poetic world of Shakespeare. And the rhythmical intricacies of Spencer and Dryden and all the great poets. And the critical acumen of Dr. Johnson. And the contempor contemporaneity of Yeats. Other things about Yeats, too, are also part of the picture. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. But these are doorways into other poetic worlds that appear to us when we step over the threshold into the world, the poetic world of Robinson Jeffers, because these are people that I mentioned, they were teachers, influences, you might say. Mm -hmm. So, but what Heraclitus would say in a quip or a saying, Jeffers in this case, in this poem, goes into a, 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 with a little bit more um, amplitude. That's a good word for Jeffers to begin with. The feeling, the aesthetic feeling of his lines, the amplitude, the simplicity, and the way they fit together, and the clarity of their outline. These are things I want to mention, lest I forget them later on. <laughs> All right. But then there's a gap in the lines. And another paragraph? Or is it a strophe? Strophe? Or is it a verse? Because what Jeffers did stylistically for us, among many other things, he took back from prose what poetry had ceded to modernism uh, before. He took back from prose its ability to sustain long explanations of sustained attention in a simple syntax, much like the spoken language of the people. Because some of his aesthetic um, impetus comes from kind of, he doesn't want to speak in phantasmagorical terms like the other modernists, like he felt like Mallarmé had come to the end of the road of Mallarmé, whereas other poets found it to be the beginning of their road. It was the end of Mallarmé's road. For other poets, it's the beginning of their road, and, but for Robinson Jeffers, no, because to continue upon the road of Mallarmé would continue to enter into the void of pure style without content. And it didn't work for the landscape in which Robinson Jeffers was living, at the edge of the continent. But here he's talking about a microscopic vision of, of what his outer eye also sees. Anyway, but here, so there's a, a gap and then the beginning of the next chapter. For after a time, the cells of life bound themselves into clans, a multitude of cells to make one being, as the molecules before made had made of many one cell. Meanwhile, they had invented chlorophyll and ate sunlight, cradled in peace on the warm waves, but certain assassins among them discovered that it was easier to eat flesh than feed on lean air and sunlight. Thence the animals, greedy mouths and guts, life robbing life grew from the plants. It's almost as if he says here, as asserted in the mythological fiat, that predators arose, and it was a change, in, a, a, a key change, <laughs> a key change in the long symphony of ev evolution, a key change when assassins arose that discovered that it was, <clears throat> you could feed on the energies of life through the flesh of other beings. Assassins arose, predators, in other words, and he coincides here with his poetic license that, this was the transition point from plant life to animal life, right? Starts off with the, 
the chemical life and then the plant life and then the animal life and the transition into animal life includes this element of something predatory. Hmm. And so the ocean ebbed and flowed many plants and animals. Many plants and animals were stranded in the great marshes along the shore where many died and some lived. From these grew all land life, plants, bees, beasts, and men, the mountain forest and the mind of Aeschylus and the mouse in the wall. This harsh selection. Some live and some die. Some feed upon others. And we are only taking our first tentative steps upon, upon the earth when this is, what, a burden on our supposed sense of morality, which seems to grow mm, as a much more later refinement of the whole thing, this morality business, hmm? which just leads us to the shadows that uh, darken our contemplations. But Jeffers is up to the task. Anyway. And what is this thing called life? But I believe that the earth and the stars too, and the whole glittering universe and rocks on the mountain have life. Only we do not call it so. I speak of the life that oxidizes fats and proteins and carbohydrates to live on. And from that chemical energy makes pleasure and pain, wonder, love, adoration, hatred, and terror. How do these things grow uh, from a chemical reaction? And there's the mystery as he describes it. Mm -hmm. But under the duress of the need to survive, under the duress of constant and harsh ratios of change taking place over eons, these are the foundations of the beautiful world that we all look out upon. And Jeffers is um, poetically singing the thoughts that contemplation of su such subjects inspire in him. And we are receiving the gifts of that contemplation now in the pages before us. I think they were here already. I think they were here already. He's talking about pain, wonder, love, adoration, pleasure, terror, hatred. How do they grow from a chemical reaction? I think, he says, they were here already. So, is it science or is it something beyond cause and effect? He is describing his thoughts, but thoughts can take many forms. I think they were here already. I think the rocks and the earth and the other planets and the stars and galaxies have have their various consciousnesses, consciousnesses, have their various consciousness. All things are conscious. But the nerves of an animal, the nerves in the brain, bring it to focus. The nerves and brain are like a burning glass to concentrate the heat and make it catch fire. It seems to us martyrs hotter than the blazing hearth from which it came. So we scream and laugh. Clamorous animals born howling to die groaning. The old stones in the dooryard prefer silence. But those and all things have their own awareness. As the cells of a man have, they feel and feed and influence each other, each unto all. Like the cells of a man's body making one being, they make one being, one consciousness, one life, one God. We go from the materialistic swirl into this pantheistic revelation that he sees. When he sees one life becoming all these other formations, starting with the most crude to that most refined human consciousness. One life. One life, one being, one consciousness. One God, what kind of God? What kind of God could that be? Hmm? But <laughs> the poem continues with this question. But whence comes the race of man? I will make a guess. 
A change of climate killed the great northern forests, forcing the man-like apes down from their trees. They starved up there. They had been secure up there, but famine is no security. Among the withered branches, blue famine. They had to go down to the earth where green still grew and small meats might be gleaned. But there are the great flesh eaters, tiger and panther and the horrible fumbling bear and endless wolf packs made life a dream of death. Therefore, man had those dreams and kills out of pure terror. Therefore, man walks erect, forever alerted as the bear rises to fight. So man does always. Therefore, he invented fire and flint weapons in his desperate need. Therefore, he is cruel and bloody-handed and quick-witted, having survived against all odds. Never blame the man. His hard-pressed ancestors formed him. The other anthropoid apes were safe in the great southern rainforest and hardly changed in a million years, but the race of man was made by shock and agony. Therefore they invented the song called Language to celebrate their survival and record their deeds. And therefore the deeds they celebrate. Achilles, raging in the flame of the south, Baltic Beowulf like a fog-blinded sea bear, prowling the blasted fernland in the bleak twilight on the black water, a cruel and bloody epic drama in history. Jesus and Judas and Genghis and Julius Caesar, no great poem without the blood splash. They are a little lower than the angels, as someone said. Blood-snuffing rats, but never blame them. A wound was made in the brain when life became too hard and has never healed. It is there that they learned trembling religion and blood sacrifice. It is there that they learned to butcher beasts and to slaughter men and hate the world. The great religions of love and kindness may conceal that, not change it. They are not primary, but reactions against the hate, as the eye, after feeding on a red sunfall, will see green suns. Now, there's a world in that, too, dude. I mean, I mean, I say that because I want to open up a little bit of a dialogue with Jeffers. Have I mentioned? Yeah, about Mallarmé and the symbolists and all of this. And It would seem, you know, you would, you, you, that you would take his... His initial, like, impulse to build his own aesthetic came from a reaction against the symbolists and, and all of this kind of furtive, uh, what he seemed to be evasive, you know, these furtive um, subtractings from substance in order to make a pure statement of art for art's sake or something like this. And he found then the poetry to be further and further phantasmal and dreamlike and uh, up to the coterie of, you know, those who decided amongst each other that they would give value to it. And to him, he thought, no, no, the poetry is more of something on the common tongue of the species. And it speaks of the simple, if not, not meaning easy, but the elemental things, simple in the sense of elemental, the passions and the lusts and the hatreds and the drive for survival, but also the splendors and the grace and the tremendous beauty. And he thought that poetry should be made of that. But um, at the same time, so much in Jeffers philosophically and the philosophical insights that it provokes in me, the reader, who is also by, you know, by inclination, something of a symbolist also, as Jeffers is, he just made his style a little bit different, because what I'm saying is, all these little insights, we can better appreciate them when we understand them as um, the riches of, you know, fruitful poetic contemplation, and you can bring fruitful poetic contemplation to symbolist art and French decadent art as much as you can into the great works, the classical works and the simple heroic lines of Jeffers. But, you know, it worked for him to, to be who he, uh, to be who he is, 
timelessly, just as it works for us to be in the timelessness that his works create, to appreciate it in our own terms and to enter into a dialogue with it and perhaps even to challenge it a little bit. As Gary Snyder sort of does, ironically, when he says, look at you, Jeffers, you are hot, you know, you isolated, splendid being, you prize-winning classic, you walking icon. What do you know about diapers and parsnips? Well, he raised two kids, you know, he certainly, you know, and, and, and as he mentions in his creation poem, he brings it in as a metaphor, a diaper, so to speak, hmm. and does so in a timeless way, in a funny way. So this is part of the dialogue that we create with these things um, because there is so much to draw from in the value of it, and it needn't be static in its iconic status because it will not be for us Oh, poets, because we study these things for reasons of our own, do we not? And in following those lines of interest, we glean insights into the works themselves. And so the basic thing then is the little insights that um, Robbins and Jeffers had will strike you the same way that you would get from a Mallarmé or from graffiti or from a crack on the sidewalk or from the song of a bird. But I want to... So he speaks of, of religions of love as being reactions to the elemental duress, right, of harshness. He speaks of them as reactions, religions as reactions, in much the same way as its optics, optics, in much the same way as the eye after feeding, these are his words, as the eye after feeding on a red sunfall will see green suns, the after image, in other words. So religions are after images. Okay, is, does that make them any less? No, Jeffers would say no, because we must take human consciousness as a whole, as a whole being. And as austere and public as Jeffers' aesthetic is in the way that I've described it so far, let it also be said that in other utterances, Jeffers said that it's our purpose to express our entire consciousness, our, our whole consciousness. If the art suffers for that, so be it, because we must express our whole consciousness. You know, even uh, if the external formality, the art, in other words, even if that suffers. So that's kind of a romantic way to put it. He strove, though, for that austerity of diction, the classical clear outlines and forms. But at the same time, he knew that he was dealing with these messy subjects of human passion and that the lines were vague and even when definite were crossed out of necessity for mysterious reasons. Religions is after images and after images is being part of the picture too because that is consciousness. That is what consciousness does. But let's continue with the poem. Uh, the human race is one of God's sense organs. Beautiful. The human race is one of God's sense organs. You know, I am immediately brought to mind of Dostoevsky with his tortured characters. In Robinson Jeffers' narrative poems, there's lots of tortured characters crossing all kinds of transgressive moral lines, suffering all kinds of distress. In Dostoevsky, it is a similar thing. In El Greco, it is a similar thing. Well, you could go on and on. But what it's about is, is what is being conveyed in these characters is like the antenna, the consciousness of the artist as the antenna of the human race, as you know, Pound put it and others have put it, the antenna of the human race, seeing these uh, figments and forms that reflect what is real, that go through the trials and tribulations, and yet are kind of like the sensory component of God in human experience. The human race is one of God's sense organs, uh, immoderately alerted to feel good and evil, immoderately alerted to feel good and evil, and pain and pleasure. <laughs> oh, says Whitman, I think I could turn and live with the animals all day. They are so placid and self-contained. They do not make me sick, discussing their duty to God. They do not lie awake and groan for their sins. Right, the great Whitman said something like this too. But, you know, <laughs> as a human being, uh, Welcome to being God's sense organ. 
O oh, poet, welcome to being the sense organ of the sense organ, singing the songs of language laid upon you, whether it's clear to you or not, like it is for all of us, or, or isn't. Uh, it is a nerve ending, like eye, ear, taste buds, hardly able to endure the nauseous draught. draught. It is a sensory organ of God's. As Titan mooded Lear or Prometheus reveal to their audience extremes of pain and passion they will never find in their own lives but through the poems as sense organs. They feel and know them. So the exaltations and agonies of beasts and men are sense organs of God. And on other globes throughout the universe, much greater nerve endings enrich the consciousness of the one being who is all that exists. And there he's back again to the one God. Only he arrives at it in challenging ways, does he not? But he's no less a transcendentalist than Emerson or Whitman or Thoreau or Socrates or Euripides or name them, right? They're all transcendentalists in this fell swoop. Mallarmé, <laughs> who strove for a pure expression of consciousness, right? Is, is a roll of the dice, right? Well, this is man's mission to find and feel. All animal experience is a part of God's life. He would be balanced and neutral as a rock on the shore, but the red sunset waves of life's passions fling over him. Slowly, perhaps, may man grow into it. Do you think so? <laughs> this villainous king of beasts, this deformed ape, he has mind and imagination. He might go far and end in honor. The hawks are more heroic, but man has a steeper mind. Huge pits of darkness, high peaks of light. You may calculate a comet's orbit or the dive of a hawk. Not a man's mind, he says. And he ends on that point. He starts off with this like Lucretian primeval muck, this swirling soup of chance. And then he ends with this inscrutable and disturbing spectacle of which he is one of them, of which the readers of what he writes are also deeply involved as being of the same substance of life. And at the same time, the great splendors as well are of the same substance. So it's covering a lot of ground there. Is it not? So with now, with Gary Snyder, and that poem also, to refer back to it for just a moment, doesn't he speak of Europe as a distant dream? And we will find, of course, as, the, as a classicist in this way, that a lot of Jeffers' models, of course, were, were of the classical world, you know, Greco-Roman and uh, English and, and, and all. And we will see that Gary Snyder, in that same line, of thought as, you know, artistically, you know, we live in dialogue with all of these models and, and fads and fashions come and go. And it's part of uh, poetry's commission to maintain an awareness of all the forms and models that feed one's own art, even when those models, you know, they rise and fall in, in the way that they're accepted or understood. We, it's, it's part of um, a necessary service that we provide to the culture to keep in mind what we learn from things that are not apparent to other people or to the culture at large. It's just part of this solitary nature of the individual mind as expressed in the poem. You know, the opposite of this is also true. But um, so, so when Gary Snyder speaks of like Europe is a dream, that indicates, you know, that, that you know, Snyder is a Buddhist, and his understanding of existence is tempered by long practice of these poetic forms that were not familiar to Jeffers. And um, it's part of the consciousness of the Pacific Rim, you know, to be going in this direction. Um, this becomes part of kind of his distance that he might uh, see from Jeffers. And yet, that very same meditative understanding of human nature also shows us that, yeah, Jeffers is just like us. He too fears death and insignificance. And yet we must playfully ask him, why does he write as if he stood above delusion? Well, that was because his model was the Vatic, 
the vatic glance, you know, the visionary sudden clarity, which became the content, the witnessing content of the poem. So, you, you know, that, that leaves certain thoughts hanging in the air, doesn't it? But also, the, the substance then, the resistant medium, Gary Snyder talks of the grave of his great-grandmother that he finds, and the stones are faded, and the writing on the stones, if indeed it is even stones, maybe it's a wooden tombstone, but it's faded and slanted and tilted, and he, and he had to go through a whole work of finding this thing. And then his mind... His imaginative poetic mind penetrated beneath the grass, below grass level, to find what remained as an earthly form, as a material earthly form, and it was bone. And then, you know, in the poem, he, he celebrates his, he makes his ritualistic gesture of acknowledgement and humility, and it's very, very moving. But the basic materials are the same as Jeffers works with stone, bone, remnants, blighted monuments, faded letters, following tracks, and finding hints and traces of what has, what is actually long gone, ah, and of such things as poetry made. Hmm. So let's look at some of um, Jefferson's lyrical kind of um, utterances and see if we can continue to find ways into his world. There's one especially here to the stone cutters. To the stone cutters, keep in mind in the Snyder poem, when he comes in that last stanza, in that last stanza to the grave of his great grandmother in Kansas, and he sees the names partially worn away, and yet he sees enough and reads enough to know that this is the place. Okay, stone cutting is not a recent thing in human consciousness, right? writing in stone as if that could hold its own and endure against the slings and arrows of time and circumstances, not something that people have recently thought of. We see the evidence all around. When we look with the poetic eye into the past, we see lots of things written in stone, and even that has faded. So Jeffers writes this poem, To the Stone Cutters. To the Stone Cutters. Stone cutters fighting time with marble, you four defeated challengers of oblivion. Eat cynical earnings, knowing rock splits, records fall down, the square limbed Roman letters scale in the thaws, wear in the rain. The poet, as well, builds his monument mockingly. For man will be blotted out. The blithe earth die, the brave sun die blind and blackened to the heart, yet stones have stood for a thousand years, and pained thoughts found the honey of peace in old poems. So here we see uh, a furthering of, of Jeffers' aesthetic mission, his poetic mission. Acknowledging those who have gone before the stone cutters, what they have achieved, he also achieves. And what is really achieved is nothing more than the honey of peace in old poems, in the human truth found in things that fall away. And yet in the cycle of the turning, that too feeds our sense of form, of poetic form, as it feeds those who, all those who work in resistant mediums, such as time. Ah, oh, wise men in their bad hours. I'll have to look for this poem in the table of contents. No doubt I didn't mark it, but I'll say this. Uh, this Jeffers, okay, he's a child of the Gilded Age. He's a child of the Gilded Age. What does this mean? He was the child of... Uh, of, of a Calvinist, or, well, he was a child of a Presbyterian theologian and um, uh, his father was 20 years older than his mother. Uh, it was a second marriage. His first wife had passed away and um, 
He was educated with every circumstance of, 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 a, of a nutritious education in the classics and, and the privilege to be able to, um, to send him to schools like at the age of uh, 11, he went to Europe to boarding school. His mother accompanied him you know, in a, in a ship over the sea to Switzerland. He was already precocious in these languages that his father and his mother had taught him. And um, so, you know, and he showed a lot of aptitude, so much so, you know, he mastered more than one language, you know, Greek and Latin and German and, and, and Italian and, and, and French. And, um, and then he came back. Uh, they moved from Pittsburgh to California before the earthquake in like 1904. Four, maybe even 1903. So he's on the West Coast. This is also part of the archetype. This is when such things, when oh, California is a world unto itself, is it not? And back then it was that same thing, the outer edge of the continent, far, far from the centers of culture as they are understood, you know, by those who study the classical things that he is being nurtured by. Anyway, and, and then, you know, the Gilded Age, right? The privileged childhood, the European kind of mystique and he, he went to school at Occidental and graduated a little bit early and, and then kind of a period of floundering and drift. Well, but with the precocious um, privileges that are granted to the precocious. I mean, he was a medical student for a while at USC and was a forestry student for a couple of tries up at the University of Washington. But somewhere down the line, you know, poetry and writing began to call to him. And... Um, so I will go on with a, so a little bit of that biographical stuff. But um, I want to read Wise Men in Their Bad Hours because he gives an example of his tide water kind of quality. Um, now that I've found it, I've got I've to get to it. But that's okay. This gives us a chance to pause and wonder. In the silence, what words will come next in the incipients? Wise men in their bad hours. Wise men in their bad hours have envied little people making merry like grasshoppers in spots of sunlight, hardly thinking backward but never forward. And if they somehow took hold upon the future, they do it half asleep with the tools of generation foolishly reduplicating folly in 30-year periods. They eat and laugh to groan against labors, wars, and partings, dance, dress, talk, and undress. Wise men have pretended the summer insects enviable. One must indulge the wise in moments of mockery. Strength and desire possess the future. The breed of the grasshopper shrills. What does the future matter? We shall be dead. Ah, grasshoppers, death's a fierce meadowlark. But to die, having made something more equal to the centuries than muscle and bone, is mostly to shed weakness. The mountains are dead stone. The people admire or hate their stature, their insolent quietness. The mountains are not softened nor troubled, and a few dead men's thoughts have the same temper. So this extends to the stone cutters. This extends that same kind of consciousness into stone, into mountain, also able to convey a certain feeling for the expression of, of thoughts, even in one's bad hours when one might envy those who are not so heavily weighed down by this compulsion to express one's thoughts in a medium that will resist time, you know. Even in the face of this, the creative urge can find fulfillment and expression. So this is what he's kind of, this is what he's offering to us, you know, for our, for our, if, if hope is a muscle, these kind of things strengthen it, gives us, a way to exercise it. Well, so I mentioned his 
childhood to a degree. Um, what was it that made him, though? This is a question that he would that he felt um, obligated to answer as part of his poetic testimony. What was it that was formative to him? So some of the statements that he makes do include these biographical kind of things. And when he was young and perhaps unsure of his way, uh, he, as so often happens with poets, he fell in love with Una Call, Una Call Custer, because she was already married to an attorney, a prominent Los Angeles attorney, Teddy Custer, or Edward Custer. Um, she herself was from Michigan, and she came to California, and she was a student at UC Berkeley, and she married uh, Teddy Custer, who I think was from USC, and um, they moved to Southern California. And uh, Robinson Jeffers, I think they met in, well, I could be wrong, but I think it was in a German class, and I think they were studying Faust together. And um, this was the, their meeting, and it was a pivotal time for both of them because they fell in love. And in, it was a, you know, a love affair that was not you know, utterly smooth and effortless. It, it, it took form over several years, and it included you know, the fact that she was already married, and, and um, it included separations and departures and, and um, reconciliations. And eventually, though, the divorce was granted, and they originally wondered you know, if they would move to England, Dorset, but the First World War had plans of its own, and they'd heard about Carmel as anyone would, I suppose, moving in those circles, because Carmel was this enclave just south of San Francisco. It was like a rural place, an isolated, rustic place, and yet the free thinkers had contributed to the unique culture of the, of the place, the town, the landscape, and um, it drew them, and when they set foot the place right away it seemed to be the place for them and the door opened up you know for the character of their future life and so um, the divorce was granted in the day after they were married and was that hmm, sometime in 1915 or was it uh, 1912 I'm not sure what I do know is this <laughs> as Virginia Woolf said in 1905, human character changed. Virginia Woolf said this in an essay. Sometime, I think she said in December 19... Or was it December 1910? In December 1910, I think she said, human character changed. Human relations changed. And when human relations change, religions also change. And... Artworks and the understanding of art also changes. And consciousness and cultural expressions also change. According to Virginia Woolf, it was 1910. According to D.H. Lawrence, it was 1915. And when he said a similar thing, and I think it was his novel Kangaroo, something changed about the way people saw the world. Um, who else said stuff like this? Some kind of change happened. Oh, the 1913 Armory Show in New York, where we saw, we saw, where it was exhibited and it was a place, it was a happening, um, a happening in the sense of some kind of um, page had been turned. So in the 1913 Armory Show, art show, um, that was where Marcel Duchamp's nude Descending a Staircase was first shown. That was where a work of Picasso's was first shown, a work of Matisse's was first shown. That was the time in America when this thing, modern art, well, nowadays in retrospect, we call it modernism, you know, the birth of modernism, this iconoclastic thing where the heave-ho occurred with regard to traditional forms of artistic expression. And, um, you know, Art was no longer so exactly representational. It's easy to oversimplify that because there have always been in art departures from the norm. I mean, that's what beauty is partially 
a departure from the norm, is it not? And so there's always been this. But, you know, we could just speak of it in like a cultural or social epoch or event. You know, this was kind of happening. And, and it is relevant in our understanding of Robinson Jeffers to see him in some of the formulations that I've mentioned, the aesthetic formulations, is to be kind of like a non-modernist modern or an anti-modernist modern. Because for Jeffers, the forms were becoming so attenuated that it was not like he was calling for a reactionary return to representational art, but more like he wanted to see clear outlines of the structure of a life that could be lived in a place, in a specific place, in a specific habitation, in a specific time, among people who were also living kind of a simple and elemental kind of life. And to express that in simple terms so clearly that those in other times would be able to see and understand without having to be a member of a coterie or kind of an in-group to understand like what he saw as, you know, like the decadence, like the hints and the indirections and the ellipses and the half phrases and the unstructured uh, language forms of, of, of modernist poetry as he saw. He wanted to be and have a reaction against that. Let's read some of the specific things that he did say because these are also useful in, in the way that he... Um, puts it. He writes, um, they'd moved to Carmel. He and Una, they were married now. And um, the certain other things were beginning to happen in his sense of form. They began to build a habitation, a dwelling. They began to build it out of the local material. They were influenced, you know, by the architecture of the arts and crafts movement, right? Some of them Woodstock architects, you know. Some of them came out to Carmel, too, and were around, and their influence was there. And Una was a student of Elizabethan times and architecture, and she found the inspiration of a Tudor, T-U-D-O-R, period, barn, you know, of the late Renaissance, of that architectural style, and they built their home out of granite hauled up from the shore of Carmel, stone that had been there for a thousand years, and they began to build their home along the lines of an Elizabethan Tudor barn, only it was going to be a house. But see, what is happening there is the structural habitation is beginning to have the clear outlines of a classical uh, clarity of aesthetic intention, and this was going to be their home. So it's a great mystery, really, and there's more to it to study than that. Um, but at the same time, he's walking around in the hills, and the thoughts are churning in his mind, and he's asking himself some important questions about, about his life and his life's work. And so he writes, this originality, this originality, without which a writer of verses is only a verse writer, is there any way to attain it? The more advanced contemporary poets were attaining it by going farther and farther along the way that perhaps Mallarmé's aging dream had shown them, divorcing poetry from reason and ideas, bringing it nearer to music, finally to astonish the world with what would look like pure nonsense, and would be pure poetry. Hmm. Um, it seemed to me that Mallarmé and his followers, renouncing intelligibility in order to concentrate the music of poetry, had turned off the road into a narrowing lane. Their successors could only make further renunciations. Ideas had gone. Now, meter had gone. Imagery would have to go. Then recognizable emotion would have to go. Perhaps at last even words might have to go. Or give up their meaning. Nothing be left but musical syllables. Every advance required the elimination of some aspect of reality. And what could it profit me to know the direction of modern poetry if I did not like the direction? It was too much like putting out your eyes to cultivate the sense of hearing 
or cutting off the right hand to develop the left. These austerities were not for me. Originality by amputation was too painful for me. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a clear change in where our minds might otherwise go. I mean, I know many times in my own, you know, formulations, you know, I find myself contemplating the Sanskrit, you know, neti neti, which means not this, not this. You arrive at truth by a process of reduction. It's also the via negativa is practiced at times by the, the Christian mystics. You know, you turn away from the superfluous in order to find things. Or like Heidegger said, nothingness in contrast to all that seems to be is the veil of being. Nothingness in contrast to all that seems to be is the veil of being, right? You enter the unknown by turning away from the known. Subtraction, the via negativa. Hmm. But Jeffers is talking about something else. He's talking about a structural kind of principle of putting things together in order to create something that will have a substantial existence in time and space. And it doesn't have to be material necessarily, though he's building a home and he's building out of stone, that most resistant medium. And yet he's contemplating what kind of poetry is in harmony with what I see to be real and true and substantial in the external world. And he's not finding it in uh, modernism with it, all its attenuations or in symbolist verse, though he sees the validity of it because his intuition is keen. But, you know, he knows he must walk the road that is his own. So he tells it like a story here. I laid down the bundle of sticks and stood sadly by our bridgehead. The sea fog was coming up the ravine, fingering through the pines. The air smelled of the sea and pine resin and yerba buena. I was standing there like a poor godforsaken man of letters, making my final decision not to become a modern I did not want to become, and hear this, slight and fantastic, abstract and unintelligible. I was, I was doomed to go on imitating dead men unless some impossible wind would blow me emotions or ideas or a point of view or even mere rhythms that had not occurred to them. There was nothing to do about it. We climbed the fence and went home through the evening lighted trees. I must have been a charming companion that afternoon. They say Jeffers has no sense of humor, but that's pretty funny. I must have been a charming companion that afternoon. <laughs> Slight, fantastic, abstract, and unintelligible. He did not want to be that way. So they were building their house. He was appreciating what he was appreciating, studying what he was studying. And there were hints and pieces, and, 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 and certainly, you know, in, in all the literature, you see this again and again and again, the, the works of art, those clear blocks of biologically rhythmical utterances, which are found in the ancient classics, you know. In, 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 in Whitman, it's, it's almost like the same thing. Whitman learned of the waves of the sea. Whitman pondered the heartbeat cadences of the King James Bible and of Shakespeare. And with Jeffers, it's a similar thing. And it creates a kind of you know, simplicity and elementality. And so, you know, there's, there's echoes and, and correspondences between them. And um, so they built this house. He wrote his verse. It got, you know, some degree of public acclaim. Hmm. Um, the stones um, fit together and the floor plans held true. And in 1916, they, they had twins, Garth and Donnan, and they had a dog too, more than one. You know, Haig, an English bulldog. And from 1919 to about 1925, they built the house, extensions on the house, and then, of course, 
They also built the tower, Hawk Tower, they called it. They're on the edge of the continent. Remember, um, and he built it basically himself, hauling up stones from the seashore, not all that far away, but knowing that the stones had a history of their own in the primeval <laughs> times. And, you know, with a block and tackle or a pulley device and with a, a ramp and this tower, I don't know, is like 40 feet high or something with interior stairways and different rooms, you know. So he writes about this place, this home. Much of American literature or much of any kind of literature asks, you know, about sense of place, sense of place. And so we don't need to be too specific, but we know that Jeffers has a lot to contemplate, or uh, gives us a lot to contemplate about this. Here's a poem called Tor House. It was called Tor House, where they lived. Tor House. If you should look for this place after a handful of lifetimes, perhaps of my planted forest a few may stand yet, dark-leaved Australians or the coast cypress, haggard with storm drift, but the fire and axe are devils. Look for foundations of sea-worn granite. My fingers had the art to make stone love stone. You will find some remnant. But if you should look in your idleness after 10,000 years, it is the granite knoll on the granite and lava tongue in the midst of the bay, by the mouth of the Carmel River Valley, these four will remain in the change of names. You will know it by the wild sea fragrance of wind, though the ocean may have climbed or retired a little. You will know it by the valley inland that our sun and our moon were born from before the poles changed and Orion in December evenings was strung in the throat of the valley like a lamp-lighted bridge. Come in the morning, you will see white golds weaving a dance over blue water, the wane of the moon, their dance companion, a ghost walking by daylight but wider and whiter than any bird in the world. My ghost, you needn't look for. It is probably here, but a dark one, deep in the granite, not dancing on wind with the mad wings and the day moon. Hmm. His ghost, his eye that sees the ghosts, right? but not dancing like what he sees in that blithe beauty, but a dark one within the granite, within the resistant medium. Because that is what he worked with to learn the terms of his art. But was it just stone that he learned or was it something else? Hmm? It was the changing of the seasons it was the earth beneath his feet. It was the invisible history that he could see in the things around him and language as this disturbed song within him that he sought to make clear enough to be put into poetic words according to the aesthetics that he, that was born within him, those harsh aesthetics well, harsh in the sense of working with the resistant mediums. It was all of this, you know. But there's something that corresponds to something that we do not see within that stone. Is it his spirit, a dark one? Yes, it is. But it is something else. Let's explore it here where he writes. This is a poem called Cons Continents End, Continents End. And it's to a late rainstorm. Let's hope that, to a late rain, let's hope that um, the rains come to our coast even now. Let's hope for rain because we need the water, right? Anyway, continents end. At the equinox, when the earth was veiled in a late rain, wreathed with wet poppies, waiting spring, the ocean swelled a far storm and beat its boundary. The ground swell shook the beds of granite. I, gazing at the boundaries of granite and spray, the established sea marks, felt 
behind me, mountain and plain, the immense breadth of the continent, before me the mass and doubled stretch of water. I said, You yoke the Aleutian seal rocks with the lava and coral sowings that flower the south. Over your flood, the life that sought the sunrise faces ours that has followed the evening star. The long migrations meet across you, and it is nothing to you. You have forgotten us, mother. You were much younger when we crawled out of the womb and lay in the sun's eye on the tide line. It was long and long ago. We have grown proud since then, and you have grown bitter. Life retains your mobile, soft, unquiet strength and envies hardness, the insolent quietness of stone. The tides are in our veins. We still mirror the stars. Life is your child, but there is in me older and harder than life, and more impartial, the eye that watched before there was an ocean, that watched you fill your beds out of the condensation of thin vapor and watched you change them, that saw you soft and violent wear your boundaries down, eat rock, shift places with the continents. Mother, Though my song's measure is like your sea, your surf beats, ancient rhythm, I never learned it of you. Before there was any water, there were tides of fire. Both our tones flow from the older fountain. Before there was any water, there were tides of fire. Both our tones flow from that older mountain. So an acknowledgement and a seeing within the eyes of the poem of the fire hidden within, of the fire hidden in the origins of things. And that is the true source of the song, both of the oceans and of his, the fire. Um, very Heraclitean, is it not? Hmm. Well, um, hmm. so um, he was looking at, and it, as we saw in that poem, um, the one where he speaks of the trauma, he doesn't use that word, but the pain, the anguish and the agony at the inception of the human species, and that is what has, what our passions are formed of. And that is what our life consists of so often. And we, you know, we're subject to delusions. Or as Gary Snyder says, why does he speak as, as if he's the only one who, who sees through the delusions? Well, because he's giving us, as in simple terms, again and again and again, a poetic picture of the source of our delusion. But that's the cause. What about the effects? Well, the effects are our times. And so, yes, there is that sense where we have to consider when we enter the world of Robinson and Jeffers, we find ourselves asking then, okay, you know, there is this pantheism. There is this uh, understanding of, of, of time and circumstance. And there is this religious element. We see it in the pantheistic identification with the source of all things. But there's also this prophetic element where he looked out at all these disturbing times and things which he only could offer his own perspective, you know, from within, within himself, you know, of our times. And it's, it is enormous, the prophetic aspect of the visionary eye of Robinson Jeffers, because it has so much to do with our times now. Because, um, yes, he was a child of the Gilded Age, you know, and by that I mean he got the European education and all the advantages of that and, and what, you know, was considered to be sophisticated was of great benefit to him. At the same time, though, there was a harshness, you can tell, you know, in his upbringing, kind of, and, um, and an alienation 
and all of this. And then with the changes of the world that were happening, you know, in the in inception of modernism. But then, of course, then, of course, the cataclysms, you know, of the First World War and then the Second World War and then the various uh, trials and tribulations. And he looked upon these things, too, and cast a cold eye. Let's consider some of those things. But what can we say? He always has this philosophical view of it now. You speak of, we speak of, you know, a desire to, to change the world or improve the world. And surely this is good, but um, it has to come from, poets are there to remind us that it must come from a place um, that is aware of the limitations, you know, of, of the human capacity to, to, to comprehend. Well, here's something philosophically that, that begins to touch this because it touches on so many things. The mathematicians and the physics men have their mythology. The mathematicians and the physicians, ph physicists have their mythology. They work alongside the truth, never touching it. Their equations are false, but the things work. Or, when gross error appears, they invent new ones. They drop the theory of waves and universal ether and imagine curved space. Nevertheless, their occasions bombed Hiroshima. The terrible thing worked. The poet also has his mythology. He tells you the moon arose out of the Pacific Basin. He tells you that Troy was burnt for a vagrant, beautiful woman, her face launched a thousand ships. It is unlikely it might be true, but church and state depend on more peculiarly impossible myths that all men are born free and equal. Consider that. That a wandering Hebrew poet named Jesus is the God of the universe. Consider that. See, as a similar kind of mythology, what's the difference between the two? The mythology of science exists alongside the truth, the speculations, but the thing, the instruments, the tools, the materials, the substances, they work. And then, poof, this creates a validity which takes it on its own trajectory, and inevitability falls upon inevitability. And he's speaking, of course, you know, well, he mentions it by name, you know, the weapons, the weapons of mass destruction, which he saw deployed again and again. The sophistication of the weapons of destruction, their seeming sophistication, and yet at the same time, it's only validated because it works. Is that sophistication? Especially, look what it is used for, you know, the destructiveness, the destructiveness of it all. And then, what about the myths, then, of the poet? And he makes reference to, you know, some of the, you know, the Trojan War and the Homeric myths and all of this. And then he takes it a step further, a further clarification of that myth, when he talks about the myth that give the foundation for the religions. And then it ends on that note, which is, you know, kind of ironic, you know, of, of kind of, of absurdity that, that, you know, that religions are founded on um, a different, a little bit different from, from the poetic myths and mythologies of, of a organized religion or established religion. Whereas actual authentic religious feeling is what comes from the poetic consciousness. And the myths that it feeds on are those that could be true, but are there to give us an image of the surging agency of, of all these emotions and passions. And we can draw from that and develop our own stories, so to speak, or our own lyrical pictures. But the myths that underlie religion are a little bit different. They have to like be sustained in like a cruder and more durable sense, and they're not put together with such precision, so much so that at times they <laughs> the, the mind rejects them, but forces itself to accept them, and hence is born the, the conflicts you know, within religion and the ways that it causes the disharmonies that result sometimes in this, these, these human, the anatomy of human destructiveness, as Eric Fromm said later on. Hmm. Well, um, but let's look at more some, some of the, 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 um, the specific things he said about, about war, okay? 
He wrote this in April of 1938. Um, reason, this is called contemplation of the sword. Reason will not decide at last. The sword will decide. The sword, an obsolete instrument of bronze or steel, formerly used to kill men, but here in the sense of a symbol. The sword, that is, the storms and counterstorms of general destruction, killing, destruction of all goods and materials, massacre, more or less intentional, of children and women. Destruction poured down from wings, the air made accomplice, the innocent air perverted into assassin and poisoner. The sword, that is, treachery and cowardice, incredible baseness, incredible courage, loyalties, insanities, the sword, weeping and despair, mass enslavement, mass torture, frustration of all the hopes that starred man's forehead, tyranny for freedom, horror for happiness, famine for bread, carrion for children, reason will not decide. At last, the sword will decide. Dear God, who are the whole splendor of things and the sacred stars, but also the cruelty and greed, the treacheries and vileness, insanities and filth and anguish, now that this thing comes near us again, I am finding it hard to praise you with a whole heart. I know what pain is, but pain can shine. I know what death is. I have sometimes longed for it. Cruelty and slavery and degradation, pestilence, filth, the pitifulness of men like little hurt birds and animals. If you were only waves beating rock, the wind and the iron cord earth, the flaming insolent wildness of sun and stars, with what a heart I could praise your beauty. You will not repent, nor cancel life, nor free man from anguish for many ages to come. You are the one that tortures himself to discover himself. I am one that watches you and discovers you and praises you in little parables, idol or tragedy, beautiful, intolerable God. The sword, that is. I have two sons whom I love. They are twins. They were born in 1916, which seems to us a dark year of a great war, they are now of the age that war prefers. The firstborn is like his mother. He is so beautiful that persons I hardly know have stopped me on the street to speak of the grave beauty of the boy's face. The secondborn has strength for his beauty. When he strips for swimming, the hero shoulders and wrestler loins make him seem clothed. The sword, that is, loathsome disfigurements, blindness, mutilation, locked lips of boys too proud to scream. Reason will not decide at last. The sword will decide. So, it is, you know, you don't find, uh, what do you find in that? You know, people, you know, it is the madness of our times, and he is fully aware of it, too. And it is also something, I think, uh, in, in, in any kind of, like, prophetic consciousness to expect that, you know, one, one, sees and says according to the terms of their art and then something more is demanded or you know it falls on deaf ears or, or perhaps it falls on um perhaps something is demanded of it in the world of cause and effect you know um oh all the things that all these invisible energies that work against intelligent understanding in the world hmm? the prophet you know the prophet is put up against it in a particular way, and that becomes part of the part of the utterance, part of the nature of the utterance, and why it becomes relevant beyond its own times. But then again, here's a poem called, because he does provide something more. You know, there's so much that you can see in the world of Robinson Jeffers. I'm just seeing all these jagged little doorways. Here is a poem called The Answer. Then, what is the answer? not to be deluded by dreams, to know that great civilizations have broken down into violence and their tyrants come many times before. When open violence appears, 
to avoid it with honor or choose the least ugly faction. These evils are essential. To keep one's own integrity, be merciful and uncorrupted, and not wish for evil, and not be duped by dreams of universal justice or happiness. These dreams will not be fulfilled. To know this and know that however ugly the parts appear, the whole remains beautiful. A severed hand is an ugly thing. A man dissevered from the earth and stars in his history for contemplation or in fact often appears atrociously ugly. Integrity is wholeness. The greatest beauty is organic wholeness, the wholeness of life and things, the divine beauty of the universe. Love that, not man, apart from that, or else you will share man's painful confusions or drown in despair when his day is dark. So, you know, there's the prophetic insight which brooks no compromise, which leaves you no out. And yet at the same time, there is much um, to contemplate uh, philosophically because he does have a lot to say about this. For example, in another prose work, he writes, he, he's contemplating, he contemplates these mythic figures so often, and yet he stays with the terms of what we know of them externally, but he provides different interpretations of their actions sometimes, sometimes which are quite heretical. You know, I'm speaking of his take on certain aspects of certain of the religious myths. But here's his philosophical comment on a certain theological teaching or uh, moral or social teaching that's familiar to all of us. He writes, love one another. Love one another is a high commandment, but it polarizes the mind. Love on the surface implies hate in the depth. Dante, who hated well because he loved. As the history of Christendom bitterly proves, love one another ought to be balanced at least by a colder saying. This too, a counsel of perfection, a direction giver, a guide, though it cannot be a rule. Love one another ought to be balanced at least by a colder saying. This too, a counsel of perfection, i.e., a direction giver, a guide, though it cannot be a rule. And here it is. Turn away from each other. To that great presence of which humanity is only a squirming particle, to persons of Christian faith, if any should read this, I would point out that Jesus himself, intuitive master of psychology, invoked this balance. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is, not excessively, if you are adult and normal, but God, with all your heart, mind, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself, but God, with all your heart, mind, and soul. Turn outward from each other, so far as need and kindness permit, to the vast life and inexhaustible beauty beyond humanity. This is not a slight matter, but an essential condition of freedom and of moral and vital sanity. There is that in Jeffers, which is called, you know, they even speak of his philosophy, and he used this term too, kind of playfully and kind of in a poetic way, but he called it inhumanism. And this is kind of what he's talking about. The moral beauty of the universe is timeless, and yet it sees into time, and the, the beauty of things, and the processes and cycles of nature, and even consciousness itself, as it expresses its innermost depths in in the tragedies and in the stories and in the epics and in the great loves and in the beauty and in the happiness and all of this in the human world, you know, love that. But to become entangled in it for one's own sense of oneself is to fall into delusion. It's like this, right? Remember the etching by Durer, the praying hands side by side like this, mutual participation in the good of God. This could be what he might be saying when he says, turn away from each other. Don't become entangled in each other's dreams and delusions, for they are there. Because human consciousness, as it defines itself, is born from this duress, this primeval duress that he speaks of. Now, this makes him something of a Calvinist. Well, once we get to this, 
we have to get to that. Um, what will I say? Let me check my time here, first of all, and just to see. Because for myself, you know, in my own dialogue with Jeffers, the kind of poetry that I do write, okay, the kind of poetry that I write um, is such that um, I sometimes wonder what Jeffers would make of it. It seems so feeble and so symbolist-based and everything, and yet at the same time I know that um, he... His kids were sell, were um, homeschooled. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and venture to say that. And as such, um, um, he was a teacher of literature as a parent. And um, I believe that um, were I to <laughs> come up to him, you know, I would not offer him things that I write, but I would offer instead my own work in conveying the history of literature through individual stories, you know, told to children. And I wonder what he would say about that as a worthy poetic uh, work. And uh, I don't know, I just want to throw that out yet for just a moment because um, that figures into things. But let me just read, and I better like bring things to a peroration here as, I, as we approach this time. But um, he was a tragedarian in so many ways. This was part of his nature. Um, Jeffers, for heaven's sake, I forgot to take this off, was, um, he wrote about the necessity, you know, you know, in, in Aristotle's aesthetics, you know, the pur purgation, you know, the tragic grandeur of human passions and things. And um, sometimes it was sordid circumstances, but the resolutions that the characters achieved you know, are give us the honey of peace. And so um, I'll just read this. This is um, Orestes says this when he's finally in a pure relation to the cosmos. He writes, I entered the life of the brown forest and of the great life of the ancient peaks, the patience of stone. I felt the changes in the veins and the throat of the mountain, a grain in many centuries. We have our own time not yours, and I was the stream draining the mountain wood, and I the stag drinking, and I was the stars boiling with light, wandering alone, each one the lord of his own summit, and I was the darkness outside the stars. I included them, they were part of me. I was mankind also, a moving lichen on the cheek of the round stone. They have not made words for it to go beyond things, beyond hours and ages, and be all things in all time, in their returns and passages, in the motionless and timeless center, in the white of the fire. How can I express the excellence I have found that has no color but clearness, no honey but ecstasy, nothing wrought, no remembered, no undertone, no silver second murmur that rings in love's voice. I and my loved are one, no desire but fulfilled, no passion but peace, the pure flame and the white, fierier than any passion, no time but spheral eternity. See, he lives there and that still exists. Oh. Well, all right, so I'll bring this to a close because I see that the time has done what it does. And I started out with um, a little bit of uh, a different poet from Gary Snyder talking about Robinson Jeffers. I'd like to read two poems now um, that are a little bit different, but also they get to the same thing that Jeffers is getting toward. Now, Rilke, our, you know, our, our great one, wrote earlier in the, under the persona of a Russian monk, he wrote this book of poems called Poems of the Hours, and it was translated in the 1940s, I wonder if she knew Jeffers, by Babette Deutsch, and these translations are beyond, um, have entered in my consciousness at least, you know, a realm where time doesn't touch it. And so this is an address of a Russian monk, which is the persona that Rilke is using, to God. And let us compare it now with the little taste you know, that I've run through here with Jeffers. 
the little taste of, of, the, of this um, excellence, this aesthetic excellence, this moral kind of source, this, um, this highly sensory nerve ending, this vulnerable thing, which is God, you know, this exemplary image of human consciousness, which in itself is very changeable. Well, as a Russian monk in the quietness of himself, Rilke, under the persona of a Russian monk, in the translation of Babbitt Deutsch, wrote, You, neighbor God, if sometimes in the night I rouse you with loud knocking, I do so only because I seldom hear you breathe and know you are alone. And should you need a drink, no one is there to reach it to you, groping in the dark. Always I hearken, give but a small sign, I am quite near. Between us there is but a narrow wall, and by sheer chance, for it would take merely a call from your lips or from mine to break it down, and that without a sound. The wall is builded of your images. They stand before you, hiding you like names, and when the light within me blazes high, that in my inmost soul I know you by. The radiance is squandered on their frames, and then my senses, which too soon grow lame, exiled from you, must go their separate ways. Sweet, isn't it? But now, let's go back to Jeffers for just a moment. There's that. Keep it within you. But then let's look at something in, in Jeffers that just, this really had a great meaning for me. There was a time when I was reading Jeffers uh, in a sense of my own kind of like nervous distress. And what I found to be so enriching and so healing, it was like a lifeline, when he said just somewhere the phrase, man, you might say, is nature dreaming. And this, man is nature dreaming. Nature dreaming. And for me, that expressed what I felt was really happening when there were all these figments and images and I did not know what was real and what was not real, but I began to understand it. Or it was a comfort, you know, to read that. And then there was a, a comfort um, when I read this other poem, which is called Animals, where um, let us, um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that Jeffers, you know, with his keen perception of nature and the strength of his outlines and his elemental simplicity, um, that doesn't mean that um, he doesn't see with more than one form of sight, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's not that he's a realist. I guess that's what I'm saying, you know. Something, something so much more than that. Anyway, this poem is called Animals. It starts with he's walking by the edge of the continent, looking at the sea, and he sees the sea lions, you know, and they're there before him, you know. At dawn, a knot of sea lions off the shore in the slow swell between the rock and the cliff. Sharp flippers lifted or great-eyed heads as they roll in the sea, bigger than draft horses and barking like dogs, their all-night song. It makes me wonder a little that life near kin to human, intelligent, hot-blooded, idle, and singing can float at ease in the ice-cold midwinter water. Then, yellow dawn colors the south. I think about the rapid and furious lives in the sun. They have little to do with ours. They have nothing to do with oxygen and salted water. They would look monstrous if we could see them. The beautiful, passionate bodies of living flame, bat-like flapping and screaming, tortured with burning lust and acute awareness that ride the storm tides of the great fire globe. They are animals, as are we. There are many other chemistries of animal life besides the slow oxidation of carbohydrates and amino acids. Okay, and finally I'll just read this. This is called The Beauty of Things. To feel and speak the astonishing beauty of things. Earth, stone, and water. Beast, man and woman, sun, moon, and stars. 
the bloodshot beauty of human nature, its thoughts, frenzies, and passions, and unhuman nature, its towering reality. For man's half-dream, man, you might say, is nature dreaming, but rock and water and sky are constant. To feel greatly and understand greatly and express greatly the natural beauty is the sole business of poetry. The rest's diversion. These holy or noble sentiments, the intricate ideas, the love, lust, longing, reasons, but not the reason. So, well, we can just leave it at that for now. I say, you know, we, well, my, I, would, I would say, come to Jeffers and see through the doorway of his house, either the doorway of the house that he built or the doorway of the house of his poetry or the doorway of the house that his themes open in your own mind. They are all doorways. It is an endless threshold. It is consciousness. And he is a great teacher of this and a great exemplar in the way that all poets are. So poets, uh, this is a little bit of something for us to to sink our teeth into. Let us continue to be nourished by this as we go on our way in this wild and wicked world with our eyes that, that do have the capacity, the God-given capacity, to see clearly the moral reality. And may it help us all in the riddles of existence. All right, I thank you for your heroic listening. And so long for now.